Welcome to episode eight of the Strength Matrix podcast. My name is Josh Settledge. I am the BJJ Strength Coach. And today we're talking about the top 10 exercises to build your posterior chain. We're going to be breaking down what is the posterior chain, why using these specific and unique exercises will help you get stronger, faster, more explosive, and improve your overall athleticism in jujitsu, and also how you can begin adding these exercises into your current training program so that way you are better prepared to win more matches and get injured less. But before we dive into it, I do want to let you guys know that this episode, just like every other episode, is brought to you by thestrengthmatrix.com. The Strength Matrix is your one-stop shop for all things strength and conditioning for jiu-jitsu. If you're looking to win more matches, get injured less, get stronger, improve your conditioning, increase your explosive power, and decrease your overall risk of injury, the Strength Matrix is going to be there to help you out. It's no BS training for the jiu-jitsu athlete, and the Strength Matrix is offering a free four-week strength program that you can download. It's there's no strings attached it's super simple it's simple and brutally effective in helping you get stronger specifically for jujitsu and if that's something you're interested in then you can click the link in the description below of this podcast and without further ado let's dive into it let's go over the posterior chain and the top 10 exercises you should be doing to build your posterior chain so you can be a better grappling athlete The posterior chain is essentially the chain of muscles starting from your low back going all the way down to the back of your legs. So starting from the top, going down to the bottom, we have your low back. Those are the muscles of your spinal erectors, your QL or your quadratus lumborum. And it's going to go down to your glutes. Pretty hard to miss that. Those are pretty big. And then underneath your glutes, we have your hamstrings. Some people like to include your calves in the posterior chain as well. Um, and your calves are definitely a very important muscle group and should be trained, but that's not. we're not really going to be going over calf-specific exercises today. We're mainly going to be focusing on exercises that will specifically strengthen your low back, a.k.a. your spinal erectors your glutes, aka your cheek meat, and your hamstrings. The posterior chain, that that chain of muscles or that group of muscles, is the center of all athletic movements. When you jump, you load up the posterior chain. When you sprint, you're driving and launching off the ground in each step with the posterior chain. When you slap on a really tight triangle choke and put someone to sleep, you're using your posterior chain. Here's the deal. You, you really can't be strong if your posterior chain is weak. And if you want to become a better grappling athlete by getting stronger, you have to address your posterior chain. You cannot only do bench press. You cannot only do pull-ups. Uh, I, I've shared this story before on my Instagram and uh, maybe on a couple other YouTube videos, but I worked with a wrestling coach one time that said uh, that wrestling athletes, they don't need to do... Uh, well, now I'm mixing up my stories, but first story of something a wrestling coach said, which was ridiculous, was he told me when I came in to be the uh, strength and conditioning coach for this team, he said, I don't want the wrestler squatting because it's going to make them slow and it's going to make their legs big. And I was like, okay, all right, you know, sure thing. I, I, I hear you there. I understand your concern. But that was their style of training up until I had shown up. They mainly only did push-ups, bench uh, dumbbell rows, pull-ups, and all those are great exercises, but they completely neglected training their lower body, specifically their posterior chain. And there were a lot of injuries. There was a lot of, um, missed opportunities to be explosive and powerful just because it hadn't developed their posterior chain. And when you skip out on your posterior chain, you're skipping out on a lot of athletic power, a lot of speed, and a lot of strength. You're just leaving it all on the table. And as a grappling athlete, it's important that you develop your posterior chain so that you can ultimately enhance your overall grappling performance. And so we understand what the posterior chain is, those chain that, you know, that large group of muscles. We understand why it's important, but how do you go about actually strengthening that group of muscles in a way that's actually going to transfer over to jujitsu? Um, a common misconception is that you know training any muscle in any way is going to have benefit for jujitsu, and that's true to a certain extent. 
You could do things like bicep curls, which are great for jujitsu. You can do things like cable rows, which are a great exercise for jujitsu. But how we're going to be developing the posterior chain, there are 10 exercises, in my opinion, that work best for jujitsu athletes. There's a few isolation exercises in this list. There's a few compound lifts in this list. But what's important is, is that we have a broad approach that covers all of our bases when it comes to strengthening our posterior chain. So when we're talking about strengthening our hamstrings, we can't just do machine leg curls. When it comes to strengthening our glutes, we can't just do glute kickbacks on the cable machine. We need to incorporate a lot of different exercises and train them in in a variety of ways so that way we can get the most out of our training, make our posterior chain as powerful and as strong and as explosive as possible so that way we can be a better grappling athlete and decrease our risk of injury. So kicking off the list, exercise number one, the squat, aka the squat. I say squat and I spell it S-K-W-A-A-T just because that's how my mentor Mark Bell spells it and how he says it so I take after him. But anyway, exercise number one, the squat. Many people and myself included consider the squat to be the king of all exercises. When the squat is done with a technique that pushes the butt back slightly where you're loading up the hamstrings and the glutes, it could be a great exercise to strengthen the posterior chain as well as a movement called hip drive. This is something that um, a world-renowned strength coach, Mark Ripito, talks about in his book, Starting Strength. We're not going to get too deep into it today, but there's a way you can squat that is actually amazing to strengthen your hamstrings and your glutes. Uh, On the other end of the spectrum, there are ways of squatting, especially uh, squats that Ben Patrick, aka Knees Over Toes Guy, is a big fan of, that more so strengthen your quads. And those are great too. But when we're talking about the posterior chain, it's important to differentiate the two. So when we talk about squatting specifically to develop our posterior chain, we need to focus on pushing our butt back So that way we can get a little bit more load on our glutes and a little bit more load on our hamstrings. When you're, when you squat and you're driving your knees forward over your toes, that is not a bad thing, but it does place a lot more load on your quads and the posterior chain includes the opposite of your quads, which are going to be your hamstrings or those big muscles on the backside of your legs. So when you're doing a squat and the, if the goal for that workout or that training phase is to strengthen your posterior chain, think about pushing your butt back slightly, driving your knees out, maintaining a pretty vertical shin angle. And that's going to be a great way for you to load up your glutes and your hamstrings. Uh, I would also consider box squats to fall into the category as well. When doing box squats, because you have that stopping point that's going to catch you, you can actually sit your hips back and your butt back much further um, and even place more load on the posterior chain than compared to doing a free squat. Um, Maybe in the future, I'll do an entire episode on all the different types of squats and how you can use them. But exercise number one, as far as some of my favorite exercises to develop your posterior chain, squats. And when we're talking about squats to develop the posterior chain, remember that we need to perform them correctly. So push your butt back, drive your knees out, maintain a fairly vertical shin angle, and really feel that load in your glutes and your hamstrings. Exercise number two is going to be the good morning. The good morning is essentially a standing Romanian deadlift with the bar on your back, which we're going to talk about the Romanian deadlift in a, in a little bit, but the good morning is almost like the first part of that squat that we were talking about where you're pushing your butt back, loading up your hamstrings. You're not necessarily bending that far at the knees. You're going to have a slight bend in the knees, but you're not going to be squatting downwards where your hips get close to parallel with your knee. The good morning is pushing your butt back like you're some, like, um, you're pushing your butt back like you're uh, an Instagram thought, if you will. But you're going to push your butt back. You have the bar on your back, or you can do a Zercher good morning with the bar and the crook of your elbows. And the goal is to find that loaded stretch feeling in your glutes and your hamstrings. What this does is this is a amazing eccentrically loaded or eccentrically focused exercise for the glutes and the hamstrings. Every muscle that contracts has three motions to it. 
or three parts to it, I guess I should say. So when you're doing a bicep curl, when you are lifting the dumbbell or lifting your hand towards your shoulder and you're flexing really hard, that's called the concentric motion or the concentric portion of the exercise. When you pause at any part of the range of motion, that's called isometric. You're isolating that position and you're not moving. Then when you are lowering your arm or lowering the dumbbell on a bicep curl and you're lengthening your bicep, that's known as the eccentric portion of the exercise. And the eccentric portion of exercises is actually very important. And if you can focus on the eccentric portion, studies have shown that eccentric focus training has done just amazing wonders as as far as helping you build more muscle, strengthen connective tissue, and improve your body's ability to absorb force in a controlled manner. So the downside of eccentric training is that it is very taxing and it'll make you really freaking sore very quickly. So when doing the good morning, part of what makes it such an effective exercise for the posterior chain is that it is a eccentric focused movement. Now, when doing this, you want to make sure that you are make are having a properly braced trunk and spine. This is an exercise that anytime I talk about it on social media, people always comment and say, this exercise is stupid. This is exercise that Bruce Lee hurt his back with. And that's true, but that's because Bruce Lee was doing the exercise incorrectly and didn't do a proper warm up. So the good morning is an amazing exercise that I would suggest just about every athlete do, especially jujitsu athletes. Just make sure you're taking the time to warm up. Just make sure you're taking the time to learn how to do the exercise properly. Learn how to brace your spine and protect your lower back while you're doing the exercise and really search to feel that loaded stretch in your glutes and your hamstrings. Now we're kind of moving the bar lower and lower figuratively and physically because exercise number three is going to be the deadlift. The bar is not on our back. It's going to be on the floor and an entire podcast can be dedicated to a conversation on the deadlift, which we may do in the future. But essentially what you need to know is that the deadlift and many of its variations, specifically the conventional deadlift, stiff leg deadlift, sumo deadlift, um, stiff leg sumo deadlift, all place lots of load on the posterior chain. The deadlift is different from the squat and the good morning in that it is a concentric only movement. The good morning, which we just talked about, has both the concentric and eccentric. So the eccentric is when you're lowering the bar during the good morning. The concentric is when you're raising the bar up. The deadlift, on the other hand, is essentially a concentric only movement. Now you can do deadlifts in a specific way where you are very slow bringing the bar back down to the floor. But when you start that first rep of a deadlift, you don't have to lower it. You just bend down and pick it up. So it's a concentric only lift, or most of the time it is a concentric focused lift. This means you do not have the luxury of using the stretch reflex to help assist yourself out of the hole. So the stretch reflex is essentially that bounce sensation that you get when you squat real deep, or maybe you're benching and you can kind of like bounce it off your chest. That's sometimes known as the stretch reflex. Because you are not lowering the bar on a deadlift, you don't have the benefit of being able to use the stretch reflex. So when you pull that first rep off the floor, you just have to pull it from a dead stop position. And this is an amazing method to get strong, doing dead stop reps or doing reps where you're taking away the stretch reflex. That's another big reason why I'm a huge fan of the box squat because you have to sit on the box, come to a dead stop position, and then be explosive and powerful as you stand up off the box. You are getting a little bit of a stretch reflex, you know, that's maintained while you're on the box because you can maintain the benefit of the stretch reflex for, I think about up to three or four seconds, but it is much more difficult than just dive bombing a squat and bouncing out of the hole. You actually have to come down, sit on the box, come to a dead stop, and then explosively stand up. The deadlift is like all the benefits of doing a box squat just for the deadlift position. So you can't lower the bar down and and bounce the bar off the floor or anything. Some people do that and you shouldn't, but every rep on the deadlift should essentially feel like it's coming from a dead stop. Now, as a continuation of the deadlift, we have the Romanian deadlift, which it's called the Romanian deadlift. I don't know if 
Romania is responsible for inventing this exercise, but it's an amazing exercise and it's number four on the list. And this needs to be differentiated as its own exercise because of one key difference. The RDL or Romanian deadlift is similar to a standard deadlift in that it places a lot of load on the posterior chain. However, it is not a concentric only movement. When done correctly, RDLs will be done in a fashion where you push your butt back and simultaneously lower the bar enough to feel a loaded stretch on the hamstrings. Then you're going to raise the bar back up and squeeze your glutes at the top. So to do this, a lot of times people will start standing. They'll unrack a barbell from a power rack, or maybe they'll um, do a regular deadlift to get the bar up and the start position at the very top. Then they'll do an RDL on the way down, which is very similar to the same movement of the good morning and what we talked about on the squat, focusing on pushing your butt back first and really driving your butt back so you can feel that loaded stretch in your glutes and your hamstrings. Now on a good morning, the bar is gonna be resting on our back. For an RDL, the bar is gonna be resting in your hands, similarly to how you would have the bar resting in your hands if you're to do a regular deadlift. The RDL is awesome because you are able to turn the deadlift, the standard deadlift, into a movement where you can get the benefit of the eccentric portion of that movement. So how we would structure this in training is, say we go really, really heavy on some deadlift singles. You do three heavy singles on a standard deadlift. That's awesome. You got three heavy reps focusing on the concentric portion of the deadlift and loading up the posterior chain in a concentric manner. Then to get a little bit of eccentric loading, we may follow that up with a few sets of RDLs or Romanian deadlifts. Now, of course, the Romanian deadlift is a secondary exercise. It's not necessarily what we would consider a main movement where we would max out on that. I don't necessarily think people should be trying to max out their RDL. It seems, um, a little risky in my opinion. Similarly, I would not suggest you max out on the good morning. Working up to a three rep max or a five rep max is totally fine as long as you're maintaining proper form and technique, but you can do a one rep max in the squat and get a lot of benefit from that. You can do a one rep max in the deadlift and get a lot of benefit from that. But from some of these variations where we're specifically loading up the glutes and the hamstrings by pushing our butt back a little bit farther and isolating those muscle groups, those are exercises that you don't necessarily want to be maxing out with. Doing sets of three to five um, for RDLs, you can even do upwards of eight to 10 reps for hypertrophy. You just want to be careful with those and uh, don't hurt yourself. Protect yourself before you wreck yourself. And here's a pro tip. If you're having a hard time on RDLs and you only feel it in your low back or you are thinking like, I, he keeps telling me to push my butt back, but I don't really feel it on my hamstrings. I'm not really getting why we're doing this exercise. A pro tip that I picked up from Cal Dietz, who is uh, the Olympic strength coach at University of Minnesota, one of the greatest strength and conditioning coaches who's ever lived. He actually said to press your big toe into the ground as you're lifting the weight up to get more glute activation. And it sounds kind of hokey pokey and it's like, okay, Cal, like sure thing, dog, is this really gonna work? And I freaking tried it and it did work. So now anytime I'm doing an RDL or anytime I'm doing a good morning or any other type of glute focused exercise, as I'm doing the concentric or the actual lifting of the exercise, I'm sure to press my big toe into the ground to just get a little bit more glute activation. If you're standing or walking as you're listening to this podcast, just stand still for a quick second, lift your big toe off the ground, squeeze your butt as hard as you can, relax for a few seconds, and now try it again, and before you squeeze your butt, push your big toe into the ground, and then squeeze your butt. It's in, it's absolutely insane how much of a difference in, uh, contraction you can get in your glutes when you press your big toe into the ground. That being said, that brings us to exercise number five, the sled drag. Like I said on some of these other exercises before, an entire episode could be dedicated to the benefits of dragging a sled. The sled drag is one of the greatest exercises of all time for grappling athletes. 
Up until this point, we've talked exclusively about bilateral movements. So exercises that are taking place while you're standing on two feet, you're doing a two footed squat, a two footed good morning, a two footed deadlift, a two foot RDL, and you're working both sides of the body or both sides of the lower body at the same time. Dragging a sled allows you to concentrically train your posterior chain in a unilateral fashion. Now, what does that mean? A sled is similar to a deadlift in the sense that every step you take is from a dead stop position. You do not have to lower um, the weight on a sled. You are not lengthening your the you're not, you're not, you are essentially not lengthening the muscles of your lower body when you're doing a sled. At least you're not doing any weighted lengthening movements. You're just walking. And so every step, you're contracting your hamstrings, you're contracting your glutes as you're walking forward, and every step is from a dead stop position. So it's a great exercise to build up a ton of work and a ton of training volume for your posterior chain without necessarily eccentrically loading those muscle groups. And like I mentioned before, eccentric loading is awesome and it's important. However, it can leave you pretty sore and pretty banged up afterwards. So if you're at a part in your season or in a section of your training phase where you're doing tons of jujitsu and you can't really afford to go to jujitsu sore all the time, mixing in some sled drags is a great way to get in a ton of work and still feel pretty good afterwards. Not only that, but like I mentioned, it's a unilateral exercise. So you're training to one side of the body at a time. Now, each rep, if you will, or each step is going to be a single leg focused movement. So you step forward with the right leg, pull through, take that step, and then you step forward with your left leg, pull through, take that step, so on and so forth. And so it's just an amazing exercise that allows you to isolate one side of the posterior chain as you get to focus on pulling back with your heel. So when you, you step, you want to pull back with your, dig your heel into the floor and pull your heel back as you've uh, flex your hips forward. And it's a great way to light up your glutes and your hamstrings. The sled is also a great tool to develop GPP and conditioning or general physical preparedness. G uh, general physical preparedness essentially refers to your base level of fitness to do whatever training or do whatever sport you're deciding to do. So we all know what it was like on our first day of jiu-jitsu. It's like, okay, I feel like I'm in pretty good shape. Maybe I run a little bit and you do one round of jiu-jitsu and you immediately discover that your conditioning is not as good as what you think. So you may have a great base of fitness for running or for soccer or for tennis, but your base level of conditioning for jiu-jitsu is actually pretty poor. So focusing on uh, sled dragging and using the sled as a way to build your general physical preparedness is a great way to increase the foundation of your fitness. Now, I've talked about this before, a pyramid is only as tall as its base. I originally picked that quote up from Louis Simmons. So if you're able to widen your base level of fitness, that means you have a greater potential to reach a higher peak in your athleticism, in your fitness, and in your strength, conditioning, explosiveness, power output, all that good stuff uh, when it comes to your performance on the mat. The sled is also a great tool you could use to work around injuries. If you have an upper body injury or even a lower body injury, and if you could just drag a sled, it's a great way to still get in a ton of work for the lower body without necessarily having to put yourself at a greater risk of injury. So I've had several athletes that maybe they competed in a tournament and they got their leg cranked on and they're you know, their heel, or I'm sorry, they got caught in a heel hook, so their knee isn't doing too well. We can't stop training completely. They shouldn't just sit around and do nothing, but they can't necessarily squat heavy. They can't necessarily deadlift heavy. So something I'll have them do is say, hey, load up the sled, drag it for 10 minutes straight, see how you feel. And a lot of times, because it is such a concentric focused movement, and you're getting tons of blood flow through to the lower body, a lot of times they start to feel a little bit better after spending about 10 minutes dragging the sled. Moving on to exercise number six, we have the Bulgarian split squat. I've talked in depth about the Bulgarian sp split squat back in episode two of the Strength Matrix podcast. It was one of my favorite exercises or one of the best exercises, in my opinion, for grapplers. And just to review, the Bulgarian split squat is a great unilateral exercise 
to strengthen the glutes and the hamstrings, as well as improve the stability of your hip, knee, and ankle. You can use this exercise for hypertrophy training, doing it for loaded sets or adding some weight in the eight to 12 rep range. And you could also use it as part of a strengthening exercise, doing sets of four to six reps. You could add weight on there as well. And if you do a body weight, you could use it for explosive power and improving your jumping ability. So something that I actually did yesterday was we did our dynamic effort work, which is where we're focused on speed and explosive power. We did split stance, trap bar, deadlifts. And then as soon as we do a set of those types of deadlifts, we would go right over to the bench and we would do a Bulgarian split squat jump. And let me tell you, my uh, glutes are pretty freaking sore after that, but it felt good though. It's a great way to train unilaterally, unilaterally, excuse me. So you're training one side of the body at a time because you're standing on one leg. It's a great way to improve hip, knee, and ankle stability, which if you can improve stability in those areas, you significantly decrease your overall risk of injury, which is always a good thing. And then it's just an amazing exercise for building more muscle of the lower body. Some of the greatest hypertrophy or muscle building gains I ever made happened when it was actually uh, during quarantine, the first part of quarantine back in 2020. And I did a training phase where I would do six sets of six reps of Bulgarian split squats. I would do that with a dumbbell each week, adding a little bit more weight. And I would do that for four weeks. And then I followed that up with another four weeks of doing eight sets of eight reps of dumbbell Bulgarian split squats. And let me tell you, my hamstrings and my glutes got so freaking big. I had to get rid of a whole bunch of my shorts and a whole bunch of my pants because uh, I got that junk in the trunk, if you know what I'm saying. So let's just say that uh, my glutes be blown up after doing a bunch of Bulgarian split squats. Exercise number seven, the reverse hyper. Up until this point, we've talked a lot about exercises that actively compress the spine, and not that that is necessarily a bad thing, it just it is what it is. But uh, all the exercises we've talked about are spinal compressors. So you put a bar on your back to do a squat, you're getting spinal compression. You put a bar on your back to do a good morning, spinal compression. You are deadlifting, you are getting a little bit of spinal compression. It's the forces and the biomechanics of what types of forces are put on the spine are obviously much different when you're holding the bar in your hands versus holding the bar on your back. But still, it's a lot of load that is placed on your lower back. And the reverse hyper is the first exercise on this list that acts as both a decompression exercise for the spine and a way to strengthen the glutes and the spinal erectors. The reverse hyper is one of the best pieces of equipment out there. It was originally invented and designed by Louis Simmons. If you've never seen a reverse hyper, imagine you are at a really tall dinner table and you lay your upper body on top of the dinner table and let your feet and legs dangle off the edge. So when you let your feet and your legs dangle off the edge, if you start swinging a little bit, you can swing your legs underneath the table just a bit. And then if you swing back really hard, you can start flexing your lower back and flexing your glutes and get a really good contraction from there. And what this does is it allows you to decompress the spine. So when your legs swing underneath the quote unquote table a little bit, you're getting a little bit of a stretch in the lower back, you're decompressing the bones called the vertebrae, which are those the bones of your spine, you're allowing those bones to stretch and space out just a little bit. And when you do that, you get what's called a traction force, which is attraction forces where you're pulling in two opposite ends. And when you're pulling in the two opposite ends of your spine, just a little bit, you obviously don't want to break your own back. And you can't really break your own back on the reverse hyper, but you know, you definitely wouldn't want the Hulk to rip you in half. Like you ripped, uh, I think you ripped Wolverine in half one time. Anyway, that's a whole different story that probably shouldn't be on this podcast. But when you get a little bit of attraction force going, what it does is it allows for the discs in between each of those vertebrae 
to get more blood flow, to get more nutrients, to not be constantly squished all the time. And it's a great way for you to improve the health of your lower back and improve the overall uh, stability and decrease any pain that you're experiencing in your low back. At least for me, it's helped decrease a lot of pain on my low back. And that's what happens when your legs are underneath the table. And then when you swing upwards, you're getting a really big contraction of your glutes and your lower back, AKA your spinal erectors. And what's awesome about that is you can get decompression and strengthening in the same exercise. And when you do that and you do lots of reps, say sets of 25 to 50 reps, you start getting a little bit of a lower back and a glute pump which is awesome because that means you're able to start increasing blood flow to your lower back. Louis Simmons has talked about this a lot of times where he said, why do people have so many back injuries? Well, you tear your hamstring or pull your hamstring, it turns black and blue, which means as a, it already has a great supply of blood flow uh, to that muscle group, but you hurt your low back, it doesn't turn black and blue. And why does it stay hurt? And that's because it has a limited supply of blood flow, or at least it doesn't get as much blood flow as say our pec or our hamstring or our uh, quad or something like that. So one of the best things that you can do to mitigate injury and help recover from injury is to increase blood flow. That essentially goes for any injury. And when we take an exercise like the reverse hyper, where we're able to get some decompression of the discs in your lower back and strengthen the muscles surrounding your lower back, that's going to be a A plus for us. Exercise number eight, back extensions. If you do not have access to reverse hyper, the next best thing to directly train your spinal erectors is to hit up the 45 degree back extension. This piece of equipment will not actively decompress the joints of the spine like the reverse hyper will. However, it will allow you to train the spinal erectors directly with both higher loads for strength and lighter loads to perform to promote blood flow through the lower back. So it's one of those things where you kind of lock your feet in and you place your hips on that pad and then you fold your upper body over the top. What this does is it allows you to strengthen those thick muscles on your lower back and you can even change your upper body position to strengthen your glutes. So when you're doing a 45 degree back extension for your low back, you wanna have a really tall chest position. Think about puffing your chest up, pointing whatever text is on the front of your shirt. You want to point that as high as you can. It's a great way that as you're folding down and coming up, you're isolating your lower back and strengthening your spinal erectors. If you want to strengthen your glutes with this same apparatus, all you have to do is just do the opposite of what I've just said. So instead of puffing up your chest and keeping a nice strong upper back position, you actually want to round your upper back. And when you raise your torso up, you want to flex and squeeze your glutes and push them into the pad. So it's a great way for you to strengthen your spinal erectors and your glutes. Exercise number nine. This is one of my favorite exercises of all time. And it it's just amazing for decreasing knee pain, increasing knee stability, improving your general physical preparedness. Uh, it's just an amazing exercise for so many different reasons. And that's going to be the banded leg curl. If you follow me on social media, you know that I'm absolutely, absolutely in love with the banded leg curl. Because we're using a band, it's an accommodating resistance, which allows you to get the appropriate tension at both the beginning of the movement and at the end range. So bands, because they're elastic, they're what's called accommodating resistance. And accommodating resistance allows you to match the level of tension with where you're at in an exercise. So when you're doing a let's say you're well we'll just stick with the leg curl. When you're doing the leg curl, it's hardest at the very beginning when you're trying to get the movement started. But then it gets a lot easier once you get closer to pulling your heel to your butt. And so when you're doing that, you're kind of only training at that end range, we're right at the start of the movement where the exercise is hardest. Think about a, a bench press. The exercise is hardest when you're trying to press the bar at the very beginning off your chest. And as you get closer to lockout, it gets much easier. If you were to add bands to either of those exercises, you would actually be able to keep the beginning portion of the lift difficult like you want it to. But then as you would normally get to that easier part of the lift towards the end range. If you have a band, the band is going to start 
having more and more and more resistance because it's elastic and you start stretching that band as you get closer to pulling your heel to your butt it's going to become much more difficult so what you're able to do is get the proper resistance through the full range of motion on the leg curl which means that you're able to train every section of your hamstring you're not just training the beginning portion of the leg curl movement and you're not just training the very end range of the leg curl movement but you can get a full contraction of the hamstring by you doing banded leg curls and that's one of the main reasons why i'm just such a huge fan because when you're using accommodating resistance you could use banded leg curls for a warm-up before a squat session good morning session deadlift session whatever you can use it for joint restoration you could use banded leg curls for local muscular endurance you can use it for strength and you can also use it for hypertrophy another big contributor to why my hamstrings blew up uh, over quarantine in 2020 was because i was finishing every workout with about 100 to 200 reps of banded leg curls and my hamstrings got freaking jacked let me tell you um i've i've kept the banded leg curl through many phases of my own training and through a lot of phases of training for the athletes that i work with and they've never failed me it's been an amazing exercise to blow up your hamstrings build a bulletproof posterior chain and it's amazing for knee health and knee stability so i highly encourage you all to mix in some banded leg curls now lastly but certainly not least, exercise number 10, we have the Nordic curl, one of the ultimate exercises to test your hamstring strength. The Nordic curl is essentially a pull-up for the lower body, and it's a great way to strengthen the hamstrings and all the connective tissue on the back end of your knee joint. Even if you can't do a full unassisted Nordic curl, which is totally fine, it took me several years to work up to the point where I could do unassisted Nordic curls, the regressions of the movement can still be great to include in your training. So doing partial range of motion Nordic curls where instead of starting from a fully upright position and then falling down into where your chest is touching the floor, you can do partial range of motion Nordic curls where you strap your feet in, you're on your knees, you're still going to start a Nordic curl uh, just like you normally would. And you're going to lower yourself down to a medicine ball or to a box or something where you can stop the range of motion at a point where you can still control the movement. The Nordic curl is very tough because you are strapping your feet in. So imagine like your feet are together, your legs are together, your feet are tied together, and then your ankles are locked in against the floor. Then you have to lower your body down and put all that tension in your hamstrings and raise yourself back up. That can be very difficult. So even doing partial range of motion, Nordic curls can be a great way for you to work up to doing a full Nordic curl to still get through that full range of motion, but maybe not put all that load on your hamstrings right away. You could use a a band to assist you so you can hang it from a pull-up bar come down as you get lower and lower and lower at the hardest position of the nordic curl the band is going to be giving you more and more assistance and then you can you know gain less assistance as you get back into a more advantageous position but the nordic curl it was something that i've always wanted to do uh ever since i first heard about it probably i want to say like in 2017 Actually, but maybe even a little bit before that. Might have been around 2016 when I first heard of the Nordic curl. And I tried it and I couldn't get anywhere close. As soon as I would start lowering myself down, I would just face plant right away and I couldn't do it. And I was like, these freaking suck. I'm, I'm done with these. And then it wasn't until Ben Patrick, a knees over toes guy, had come to Super Training Gym and was putting everybody on game to the Nordic curl. So I said, okay, my goal for 2021 is to be able to get a full Nordic curl. And it took a lot of time of practice and doing a lot of the other exercises mentioned in this list, banded leg curls, reverse hypers, uh, dragging a sled. I dragged the sled a ton last year. It took about a year's worth of work and practice. And now I'm able to get a few unassisted reps on the Nordic curl. Some people have been able to pick up Nordic curls a much more quickly than I was able to. Um, and that could be for a variety of factors, but regardless of those factors, they got really freaking strong hamstrings. Every single jujitsu athlete who's a competitor should be able to work up to a point where they can do at least one unassisted Nordic curl. That is a great sign that you have strong hamstrings, that the connective tissue all around your knees are rock solid and strong. 
And it's just a great way for you to strengthen your lower body so that you can have a more dynamic guard game, better control when you're in mount, better control when you're um, in back control. And just, it's a great exercise to enhance your overall performance on the mat. Do note that if you've never done any sort of Nordic curl variation before, please, 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 please be careful and start with something very light and start with a, the essentially the more assistance, the better. I started with assisted Nordic curls. Everyone that I suggest do Nordic curls, I have them do assisted variations first. Start with that. And then as you get stronger, feel a little bit more comfortable with it. Then you can gradually start to pull uh, some of those assisted variations out and get closer and closer to an unassisted Nordic curl. So that was number 10. Let's review the list on the top 10 exercises to build your posterior chain. Number one, the squat. Number two, the good morning. Number three, the deadlift. Number four, the Romanian deadlift. Those are all our bilateral exercises for the posterior chain with a barbell. Then we're going to move into some unilateral exercises being the sled drag and the Bulgarian split squat. Now we have some isolation exercises for the lower back, those being the reverse hyper and back extensions. And then isolation exercises for the hamstrings. We have banded leg curls at number nine and Nordic curls at number 10. Thank you guys so much for listening. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast episode. Don't forget that this episode is brought to you by thestrengthmatrix.com. If you guys are interested in learning more about how to win more matches and get injured less, click the link in the description of this podcast episode and you can download a free four-week strength program. There's no strings attached. You just click the link, drop your email, it'll get sent to you automatically. Then you're good to go. You can start training. It's simple, brutally effective in helping you get stronger so you can win more matches and get injured less. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'm really doing my best to uh, blow this podcast up as much as possible. I'm having a ton of fun uh, podcasting and just having these conversations with you guys. So if you got value and some solid information and tips out of this episode, I would massively appreciate it if you could screenshot it, share it on social media, tag your boy at Joshua Setledge, and feel free to shoot me some DMs about what you guys want to see on the podcast in the future. I'm pretty open to whatever you guys want want to hear about or want to learn more about because my number one mission, my number one goal right now is to help as many grappling athletes as possible, win more matches and get injured less. Thank you guys so much for listening. You guys can follow me on Instagram at Joshua Setledge and I will catch you guys later. Peace.